Hi everyone, my name is Jen. I'm an author and book reviewer. And sometimes on this channel, I make videos talking about disfigurement and disability. And this video is gonna be one of those. So no bookish chat today, though I will be talking about some bookish related things later. But for the most part, this is a video about hair loss, alopecia, and styling cheap wigs. I occasionally make videos talking about how I'm feeling about disability and rather society's attitudes to disability um, relating to my own condition. And this is, is one of those. I started losing my hair about four years ago. And in the last six months, I've started wearing wigs and I have learned a lot about that in the past six months. Steep learning curve for me. And I would like to kind of share things that I have learnt or noticed over the past six months, but also just update you about how I'm feeling about hair loss and talk about all of those things. It's not a scripted video, which you may be able to tell already. And if you would like to join me, that would be lovely. It's very hard to catch people up if they're new to this channel at the very beginning of a video, um, but I will link relevant videos in the description box down below. Whilst I don't advocate for asking disabled people what is air quote wrong with them because the word wrong is very loaded and also incorrect and also it's normally none of your business. I do speak quite openly about my own disability on this channel when I choose to, and this is one of those times. So I have a condition called ectrodactyly, ectodermal dysplasia clefting syndrome, which is a rare form of ectodermal dysplasia, which is in itself very rare, um, which does mean that sometimes doctors don't know about new parts of the condition that can materialize because we're all still learning and hair loss is one of those new things for me but it's something that I was born with the condition itself and it's affected me throughout my life I've had dozens of operations it's a clefting syndrome so generally speaking it means I have more or less of certain things and the thing that is most visible to other people is that I was born with syndactyly and ectrodactyly so I have air quotes again missing fingers are they missing if I never had them to begin with and misshapen fingers but it affects my bodies in my bodies I only have one of them it affects my body in ways that people can't see as well right so videos about that in the description box down below but today we're going to talk about hair loss in 2016 or 2017 my hair started to fall out and I was very surprised by that because I didn't know that was something that happened with people who have EEC syndrome. I went to my doctor and I thought maybe I was just stressed because you can lose your hair if, if you are stressed and I was quite stressed at the time. Um, and she thought that was possibly the case as well but she said that she would refer me to a dermatologist at the Rare Diseases Center and it was through talking to them and also talking to other people that I know through the internet who have EEC syndrome that I realized that this is something that is quite common for people with EEC syndrome to experience in their 30s. And at that point, I think I was just about to turn 30. I'm 34 now. There are many different kinds of alopecia. And I think people in general are most familiar with alopecia areata, which is where you lose all of your hair. But that is not the kind that I have. I have a rare form of alopecia, not surprising given that the condition that I have in general is rare, called scarring alopecia. Alopecia is an autoimmune disease, so your body is attacking itself because it thinks that there is a problem. And for scarring alopecia, it means my body is replacing all the hair follicles with scar tissue, so hair literally cannot grow back. There is no treatment for the kind of scarring alopecia that I have. It was suggested that I could try something which could maybe slow down the hair loss but wouldn't stop it. And that particular treatment was very invasive and also came with a whole host of not very nice side effects and it also affected other parts of my condition. And the success rate for something like that was a tiny percentage that I just thought, you know, I've got enough going on with my health and other areas that it wasn't something that I wanted to pursue. So over the last four years, let me insert some pictures. This is what I looked like before um, I started to, to lose my hair. Then it went through cycles and there was nothing that seemed to set off a particular cycle, but every so often I would be losing hair and it would be painful to do that because it felt like my scalp was, was burning. It was really weird and at first when I was losing my hair I just wore my hair up which is what I used to do with my hair anyway so it didn't make much difference to me because the hair loss was on the back of my head so it would hide the hair loss and I could just wear my hair up in a bun then it became more and more difficult to do that and also quite painful to wear my hair up when I was going through active cycles because my scalp hurt a lot 
So I started to wear um, beanies and then I wore those beanies with headscarves. I enjoyed playing around with headscarves and beanies as, as fashion choices. Um, I am a children's author and to be fair, have always dressed like a children's author even before I was a children's author. Bright colors, dungarees and headscarves were a, a fun way to incorporate that into my wardrobe, just another element of bright color. So I did that for quite a long time. Then I wore Baker Boy hats. And again, I'm inserting images on the screen so that you can, you can, you can see that. Um, and the more hair I lost, I decided I would then last year cut my hair shorter because that makes the volume bigger um, and it you know makes it look like you've got more hair than you actually have um, and so that was what I was doing up until about April this year March April this year was wearing Baker Boy caps and um, covering up the bald patches on my head and at that point and up to now I've probably lost about half of my hair and a lot of that is concentrated in one area on the back of my head but then all over on top of that my hair has thinned and if you part the hair you can see that there's just loads of patches everywhere and when I was getting ready this morning I did try and film the back of my head so that you can see I mean it's very hard to film the back of your head but here are some clips um of of that so when I first started losing my hair I did think about wearing wigs because um, I thought that could be really fun, but it wasn't something that I was ready to to do. And also I still had so much hair at the beginning that when I bought a wig and I tried it on, it felt really uncomfortable and hot and, and, and bulky. And it, I think it distressed me quite a bit because I didn't know what I was doing. And I had hoped that when I put that first wig on, it would just fit and look great and that would be the end of it. And as I have learned over these past six months when I have really focused on um, wigs and learning how to style them and seeing what worked for me, I've realized that you do have to work at things like that. You know, there is no magic wand, you wave it and you find a wig that's perfect and amazing and you don't have to do anything to it. You do have to treat it like hair and style it and that can be fun if you know that that's what you need to do. But at that point, when I tried on a wig for the first time, I didn't want to have to think about it. I just wanted a plaster, you know, I, I wanted to ignore it. I didn't want to have to do the processing bit. And I have now, or I'm at least continuing to do the processing bit. So it is easier for me to wear wigs. Um, I can't remember if I said this. The most familiar version, I think I did say this, of alopecia for people is alopecia areata where you lose all of your hair and I have lost half of my hair and I've had quite a few people say to me why don't you you know take back control <laughs> which is just a phrase that has just lost any kind of positive connotations in these last few years in in the UK has it not anyway take back control and shave off the rest of the hair and have a bald head it might make you feel better and I should say those are very well-meaning comments but they generally come from people who have never experienced hair loss and I think it's because of this this narrative that society feeds to us and it's through cancer narratives which I think is a very very it's a very separate thing it's just we link the two things because both chemo and alopecia involve hair loss but um, the process of losing that hair is obviously massively different and I can definitely see that if you are going through chemo and you know that you're going to lose your hair or the likelihood is that you're going to lose your hair I can see that it might make you feel better in inverted commas better, to, to shave your head and get ahead of that process. I can see that being true. And I think for a lot of people who are going through that process, their hope is that after the chemo, they will then start to regrow their hair and it will, it, they will come out of that. Whereas for me, um, I'm not going to have my hair grow back. And I'm also not in the middle of an incomplete metamorphosis, which I think that's what society thinks of. I think society really likes us to fit into boxes that are easily comprehensible. Like we understand people who have all of their hair and we understand people who have none of their hair. And then there are many people like me who are in the middle and society's like, could you just please get in one of the boxes because I, don't, I just don't know what to do with you. <laughs> um, and I really want to push back against that uh, because I don't think that that's, correct. I don't think that if I shave 
my head it's going to be all you know I am going to be all shiny and new and clean which is what I think people kind of associate with that um and that my state as I'm in now is almost like a visible wound that people don't want to see um and I don't I don't, I don't subscribe. I do not subscribe to, to that way of thinking. So that is the main reason that I haven't shaved my head is because um, I would like to sit in that middle space and be comfortable in it and encourage other people to be comfortable in that state too, which is sometimes easier said than done because of the way people treat you if you have a disability. Um, I understand that sometimes people can be surprised or that can appear as shock if they look at someone and they see something different that they don't expect to see. I obviously encounter that very regularly with people who notice my hands. They're expecting to see someone with 10 fingers or eight fingers and two thumbs if we're being scientific. Um, and then when that's not what they see, they're like, oh. Um, but <laughs> if we normalize disfigurement and disability, if we had more openly had these conversations and if representation of disability and disfigurement in the media we consume was better, I think that it will be better for everybody. Can you hear that? Someone is gardening. Don't do that. I think it's society. They've got a chainsaw. They don't like what I'm saying. I'm gonna go make myself a cup of tea and hopefully by the time I've done that, they'll have stopped making that noise. I made the tea, I drank the tea, uh, they have stopped now, okay. So I was saying that society is often not very accommodating for people with disfigurements and disabilities and that can make it really hard to exist, as I said, in that in-between space of not looking, you know, either having all of your hair or having none of your hair or, you know, having some of your fingers and, and not all of them. Um, it makes it harder to be comfortable being in that space all the time because it is exhausting <laughs> to be in that space constantly if you are then heavily judged for it. And I'm not going to do anything about my hands, obviously, because they're my hands. But um, I did start thinking six months ago, well, maybe it might be nice to play around with wigs some of the time to go back to that and say, you know what, it's okay to have fun with it. And then also some of the time not wear wigs either. And I can be fluid and I can do lots of different things. And I hope that I reflect that on this channel, especially when I'm doing reading vlogs, because some of the time I'll be wearing wigs and some of the time I won't be wearing wigs. And that's what it's like on a on a day to day basis, you know, in the same way that People don't wear makeup every single day. And I don't think that it's a failure, which is what I think I used to think, to, to, to wear wigs now. I think that was another reason I didn't go back to them for a long time because I thought that if I wore them, I was giving in to what society wanted of me. And I hated that. And I was like, I don't want to pretend I don't have hair loss because I'm not ashamed of it. And I think something that made me feel really guilty which if I look at it objectively I don't think is fair on myself is that I bought a wig after I experienced a really not very nice um ableist thing um and I wrote about that in sick magazine and I thought at the end of this video I might read that out for you it was um not really an article but it was a piece of non-fiction that I wrote about that experience and about being um heavily criticized and judged and shouted at for ha having missing fingers and then for not having a lot of my hair and it made me feel so rubbish about myself that that evening I ordered my first wig and when it arrived I associated that wig with what felt like defeat like I bought this wig someone shouted at me and that's not the reason I wanted to buy a wig and I had to get over that and be like okay maybe that didn't come from a good place at first but what can I do with these wigs if I want to wear them how can I have fun with them and I realized as I spoke about in the video where I showed some of the first wigs that I bought the way that I would like to wear wigs is in a fun way because as I said my clothes are ridiculous and fun if you can see it's a very colorful wardrobe so I would like the wigs that I wear to be really colorful too I don't want to at the moment 
spend a lot of money buying a, a realistic human hair wig or a wig that looks exactly like the hair I used to have to pass for someone who doesn't have hair loss because I don't care about passing for someone who doesn't have hair loss. I will proudly say to anyone who goes, oh yeah, hair looks great. I'll be like, thanks, it's a wig. Like I will be that person. And I think in part that also bleeds into being from the Northeast and uh, you know, if anyone compliments you on what you're wearing, you have to tell them that you got it for a bargain. Like you cannot just accept that compliment. You have to be like, thanks, charity shop, one pound fifty. Like <laughs> you have to tell that person. And I feel like that's kind of a bit like it is with, with the wigs too. One, I'm, I'm I'm very happy to say I'm wearing wigs and it's not something that I want to hide. But also, yeah, this is a wig right here. So that is to say that I have now found a way of wearing wigs that works for me. They're easier for me to wear now because I've invested time in working out, you know, what works, but also because I've lost a lot of my hair now, they're more comfortable to wear. And um, I thought that would be the opposite actually, but it hasn't been. And it's not smooth sailing because sometimes I will still wear wigs because I think it's easier. It means I don't have to deal with people or stares or questions or, you know, it makes me feel more confident. And that's all right. I don't have to put myself in vulnerable situations to prove a point. I would say that I do put myself in vulnerable situations anyway as someone who creates content online and as someone who is a disability advocate, so openly speaks about disability and opens myself up to the opinions of lots and lots of people. At the moment, my inbox is still very, very full of middle-aged white men who are annoyed that I talked about disfigurement in James Bond. So, you know, there's only so much that a girl can do. Sometimes a piece of armor is fine, especially when that armor is playful. So I thought I would give a run through of my thoughts on the wigs that I have bought um, over the past six months. Um, as I said, because I wanted to play around to see what would work for me, I have bought cheap wigs and I have parted ways with a few of the first wigs that I bought because they didn't work for me and they have either gone to um, cancer wards or they have gone to friends who wanted to experiment with wigs. Let's run through uh, wigs and I'm going to try on wigs as we go. So um, if you are wearing wigs, you've never worn a wig before and you still have some hair or you have all your hair if you're doing fancy dress or whatever, um, you need to put your uh, hair, <laughs> this tiny, tiny little bun here, into a tiny bun, the back of your head. Uh, or you can do pin curls if you've got lots of hair, um, which I obviously don't. And then you want to wear a wig cap over the top. Um, you can get black ones. I find these ones work best um, for me. And then I tend to put it just on the hairline so that it doesn't peep through. What was this? <laughs> so that it doesn't peep through too much. This is the first wig that that I bought. And I bought it because I used to have bright blonde hair. So I thought that this would suit me. I thought that if I bought something that had roots, it would look more natural. And I would say that's especially true if you're buying brightly colored wigs. As I said, I'm not fussed about the wigs looking like hair, but I think they sit better on my head if they do have roots. And my favorite wig is this one here, which is a peach one, which has uh, these dark roots, which I will show you. And it helps it blend for me because I have uh, dark roots. If they show through, then they blend. So this is the first wig that I bought, Midnight Upset, because someone had shouted at me. I laugh, but it's not funny. Um, and I, don't think this works for me because it's too long. I could cut it shorter. I think that uh, shoulder length hair suits me the most. It's also very straight. And I think that even though I used to straighten my hair, curly hair suits me more because naturally that's what my hair does. Um, I did cut a fringe into this. So I don't think I cut it very well, but let's try it on and see. Now, I definitely cut the fringe too short because really it should sit on my head like this and then the fringe was longer and I cut it because I had put the wig on incorrectly and if I pull it down too much, that is not fitting. Can you can you hear that? It's uh, like it bounces up and down because it's not fitting on my head properly there. So I kind of ruined this wig by cutting it in the wrong 
the wrong place but I don't think that this style of wig particularly um, suits me anyway. Okay, I've put it half up, half down, but this fringe, there's just no saving the fringe. I was too happy with those scissors when I was cutting it. So, um, no, this one may be okay with a hat, but it's not okay without a hat. And this is something that I didn't really consider when I started buying wigs because I was going for colors that I really liked, but I wasn't thinking about the hairlines and the hairlines are super important to think about especially when you're buying cheap wigs because they're often terrible and what I have therefore learned is that for me it is much better to buy a wig that has a fringe because then you don't have to worry about the hairlines. I have kept a couple of wigs that I bought at the beginning that have terrible hairlines because they look fine when you wear hats but I want to show you how ridiculous some really cheap wigs can look if you're not wearing a hat so let me get a couple of those out for you this is one of the early ones that I kept because I love it but there is no way that you could wear it without a hat and at the beginning I didn't mind because I was so used to wearing hats and I was also so <laughs> nervous to wear a wig outside, at the thought of wearing a wig outside without a hat, I thought I would never do it. Um, I would just be so worried about it flying off and that, you know, to me would be worse than not going out wearing a wig at all. Um, so this is one of the ones that I kept, but just to show you how not great the quality of wigs can, like look at this hairline. This hairline, is in no way natural at all. You often get these bumps with what these are called fashion wigs. Um, and there are amazing people, I don't know if you can take me seriously, but <laughs> wearing it like this, I'll put a hat on in a second. Um, there are amazing people on YouTube who show you how you can cut uh, the seam here and try and make it look more natural. You can also make wigs look more natural by plucking the what's this called, the parting, <laughs> that's it, with some tweezers to make it wider, which will make it look more natural. And of course, you can buy lace wigs, which tend to be more expensive, they're not always, than standard fashion wigs that don't have lace fronts. And I actually don't own any uh, lace fronted wigs because I've gone for fringed wigs on the whole, and those aren't lace fronted wigs. So this is one of the first ones that I bought, and I love the color of it, I love the length, I love the style of it, I hate the hairline, but, but, if you're happy to wear it with a wig, with a wig, if you're happy to wear it with a hat, then it's absolutely fine. And I love wearing this with a hat. Um, if you have seen my children's picture book, Franklin's Flying Bookshop, this is like Luna, but all grown up. Um, and then, hang on, put my glasses on. Yeah, I love this wig, I love it, but not without the hat because it's ridiculous. This is also one that I love the color of. Um, this is what I like to call my Annie wig. And I feel like I need to sing tomorrow whenever I am wearing it because, oh my goodness. But again, you can't wear it without a hat because it is just out of control. I feel like if I'm wearing this I need to be in the famous five or something. Look at that. Intense. Intense. But it's kind of it's kind of fun. Um, and then this other one here is the final one that I have that you I feel need to wear a hat with. And I love the colour of this one. This one needs a brush. Someone asked me if you can brush wigs. Um, and, and yes, you can, but you need to be careful that you're just brushing the top so that you're not catching this bit underneath because then you'll tear the material. So you just have to be extra you know, careful. Someone also asked me, um, can you style these with um, hair straighteners and stuff? Uh, uh, real hair wigs you can do that with but these are essentially plastic and you use hair straighteners on this then you will melt them <laughs> um, I have 
straightened a couple of fringes using hair straighteners but what I have done is I've turned them on and then I've turned them off and it's when they're really cooled down that I've used them but you've really got to be careful for that and that's not something that I want to uh, uh, promote doing at home but like research it and uh, see the safest way possible for you to do that and um, someone also asked do you wash them you do wash them um i have been using normal shampoo just because it's what i had to hand but you can buy synthetic shampoo which is what i am going to to um, purchase and so you just wash it uh, rinse it and then i have these um stands that i put my wigs on um and it helps them dry because the air can get through. Um, but yeah, this is the other one that I would wear with a hat because the hairline is not the one, as you can see. But again, with a hat, it's fine. And tip, if you are a glasses wearer and you are wearing wigs, do not put your glasses underneath the wig like this. Put it through the wig because um, that makes it look more uh, more natural if that is a look that you are going for because obviously this color hair is the most natural color hair you ever did see synthetic wigs are actually cooler heat wise than human hair wigs and that is also a reason why i bought them because the condition that i have means that you can't regulate your own body temperature um so they are easier to wear when it's warmer though i still can't wear wigs when it's really hot outside which is okay um and something else with synthetic wigs to bear in mind is that they're often very shiny and if that is an issue for you something that you would like to combat uh you can use dry shampoo and if you use dry shampoo on them it will not only help to give volume as it would with normal hair it will also help to get rid of shine which is something that i have used on many of the wigs that i have though i haven't put it on on this one yet so this one is still rather shiny as i said when i first started buying wigs i wasn't focused on the hairline it was more about the color and seeing what worked for me i learned that really dark hair doesn't suit me and really light hair i don't think really suits me either even though when i was a a young person i had white hair um so i, I think the extremes it, with regard to light and dark don't really work for me and what works for me more is fun colors wavy with a fringe about shoulder length and i found a brand of wig called i don't know if it's pronounced fail baity that's how i'm going to say it f-a-e-l-b-a-t-y fail baity and i found this style of wig that was a shoulder length cut it has a fringe they do different colors they often come in an ombre so they have roots and when I found that first wig, I thought, great. Okay, so this is the style that suits me. And then I just bought several different colors in that style of wig. I will say, like a lot of high street shops where clothes are supposed to be the same size, but just in different patterns, it hasn't always been true. Some of the wigs are longer than the others. Um, some of them are not exactly the same shape on my head. And um, when you're buying fashion wigs, they come in one size. So sometimes wigs fit more snugly than others they do come with clips often that you can fasten at the back which makes it feel more secure but i found that those actually tend to give me headaches so this brand of wig means that i can wear the wig without fastening at the back without feeling like it's going to fall off if i wear it outside without wearing a hat and all of those things are very um positive so let me show you that particular wig my favorite of those styles and i'll show you a couple of different colors in that style too so this is my favorite style of wig also can i just say having them lined up on top of my wardrobe like that is hilarious to me because sometimes i'll wake up and see them and think that they're people have you seen return to oz and the the room of heads my goodness okay but this is my favorite so the favorite color is in peach which i'll show you in a second but this is the favorite style and i have it in a few colors i have it in purple i have it in gray and as you can see it has the roots i have it in blonde um and then i also have it in pink as well my favorite color of this style of wig is this peach one each of these wigs cost about 20 pounds um if i had to choose one wig to wear every day now and forever it would be this wig here i think it suits me the most whilst the color of this wig is obviously not the color that my hair used to be i think sorry hairs everywhere i think that the style of it being quite frizzy as well as curly 
is reminiscent of my hair and perhaps why I feel the most comfortable in it. I used to just wear it like this, but I think that it looks better if half of it is up. Where is a clip? Here we go. I think it looks better if half of it is up in a clip at the back. And this wig is actually thick enough to do that without the material underneath showing and some cheap wigs, that isn't the case. Some cheap wigs, if you took up half the hair, you would just see all of the inner workings of the wig underneath. There we go, I would tuck the hair behind my ear and then, as I said, put the glasses on but kind of half in the hair instead of just underneath to help it sit better on my head. And as you can see, this wig fits so well, there is no bouncing up and down if I touch the top it just clings to my scalp it is a great fit so tips if you still have hair make sure that that is fastened as close to your head as possible wear a wig cap if you're buying cheap wigs I would recommend buying one with fringes because it's easier to to wear and then you don't have to worry about hairline if you want to make your parting look more natural you can use tweezers to make that look bigger i'll link some videos down below of other people on youtube who can teach you how to do that use dry shampoo if you want it to look less shiny try and get a thick wig so that if you do want to style it and wear it half up the insides are not showing if you're worried about heat then purchase some synthetic wigs which will obviously be the only kind you can get if you're going for cheaper wigs anyway and even though i'm not fussed about wigs looking natural because i will declare that it's a wig to anybody who, who happens to to ask or comment if that is a concern for you and you're going for bright colors i would look for something that has roots because that does look more natural so those are the main things that i have learned and if you're wearing glasses as i said to kind of slip them in amongst your hair so that it all blends in the darker roots can also help hide the wig cap underneath as well i have some great friends a couple of really great friends that i have been able to talk about hair loss with and and that process of, of buying wigs and trying them on and that has been so helpful and lovely something that's been difficult to navigate is people who prioritize their discomfort about my hair loss above my feelings and i think that, that happens a lot with regard to disability where people feel awkward around a topic and therefore don't want to broach it and they pretend that's because they don't want to make you feel uncomfortable but it's really because they don't know what they're doing and i i have some sympathy for that you know if, if you're not familiar with a certain topic it can feel a bit overwhelming but the point is in that situation if you're the non-disabled person that's your issue and it shouldn't be the disabled person's job to make you feel more comfortable around something that actually directly impacts their own life um you know i've had people who have ha expressed such relief when i started to wear wigs you know because it made them feel more at ease because i looked more normal and therefore they could stop thinking about the fact that i was losing my hair and that's not why I wear the wigs. <laughs> I'm all for celebrating disability joy and you know having fun with all these wigs and, and talking about that with people. But I don't think you can have that without also discussing why I'm wearing the wig in the first place. You know, not every single time. We don't have to have a heartfelt conversation every single time, but some acknowledgement of that I think is important. You know, do I want to talk about that? And, and how has that been? And how do I feel now? And then we can celebrate the wigs, you know? Um, I, I don't think you can just do the, oh my God, the wigs are so cool without reflecting for a moment on why I'm wearing them, especially as I've hopefully somehow discussed in this video that wearing the wigs is not an easy decision and it isn't just a, wow, this is so fun and so great. It's tied up in all of this, well, why am I wearing them? Is it because I want to wear them? Yes, some of the time, but also because society is mean and ableist and makes me feel bad about myself. We need to have these nuanced conversations, even if sometimes they happen to be in messy, disjointed video format. Um, I do have them in conversations outside of videos with people and I do write about them because writing is my job. I do that in nonfiction, I do it in poetry. A poem of mine, Alopecia, is the first runner up in this year's Poetry London competition and that's being published in their um, journal, which you can purchase here if you would like to. Um, and I have, as I said, been writing about it in non-fiction format and I thought that I would read 
uh, my piece in issue three of Sick magazine. And if you're new to my channel and aren't familiar with my books, I will link them in the description box down below. But this was the incident that made me buy a wig in, in the first place. Um, and it, I guess it is a sad incident and it wasn't something that made me happy and I'm smiling when I'm talking about it, but really it was very, very horrible. So maybe a strange note to end on. So let's talk about something happy afterwards, but I thought I would share it and I would love you to support Sick Magazine if you would like to, because um, I think they're great. They publish um, work by disabled and chronically ill people. And this is a piece that I wrote for them called In My Memory, I am a fish. Um, content warning for hospital stuff if, if you don't enjoy that. Who does enjoy that? You know what I mean. My first memory is of suffocation. It's unusual to have memories from before your third birthday. Some people have them from when they're two, but my first memory is from when I was 18 months old. It's a smell rather than anything else, a violent one. The smell you get when you jump into a swimming pool and forget to pinch your nose and the chlorine filled water reaches up to grab your brain. This is the smell of anesthetic. In my memory, I am standing. I have filled my lungs with wet air and I am screaming, screaming through the bars of a cage, which also happens to be a hospital bed. Everything around me is white, which makes no sense at all because when I close my eyes now to remember it, everything is black. I know my parents are there somewhere not in that room, but on the other side of a pane of glass. I can see their rough shadows and I am held down by doctors. In my memory, I am a fish. There's a rubber mask that's bigger than my face and suddenly that's all I can see. The smell of swimming pool water, paint stripper running down my throat, my gills clamped, I am screaming, then I am drowning and then I am fast asleep. Now I am standing outside with a different mask two actually, an FFP3 with a floral cloth mask on top. I stand like flowers in the spring sun, photosynthesizing as I wait for the queue to inch forward. I don't mind waiting. Everyone is more than two meters apart and the mood is quietly cheerful. Audrey, there's a young one here. I hear the elderly woman behind me nudging her friend. Her friend tuts very young. You know, I was speaking with my daughter and she was saying that young people can hack into the computer systems now, you know? Take our appointments. I feel their gaze on the back of my head. I don't react. Later, I will tell this story and the indignant responses will pour in. Oh, I would have said something. You should have explained. You were so restrained. I could never... But these are the responses of non-disabled people, well-meaning and lovely, but completely and happily oblivious to the fact that if disabled people responded to every negative glance or encounter, both in person and online, it would be an all-consuming task. Sometimes, though not in this instance, it is even dangerous for us to respond. We are used to picking our battles. When I get to the front of the queue, I reach into my pocket and pull out the piece of paper I was given when I received my first dose. Audrey, the woman behind me is on high alert. She's here for her second jab. Yes, but look, what is that? They fall silent. I feel my cheeks flush red and momentarily hate myself for it. The coordinator takes the piece of paper from me and smiles. At least I think she does behind her mask. If you wait over there, they'll take your temperature and then you can go inside. I thank her and walk towards the entrance of the healthcare centre where a man in a high-vis jacket is standing with an infrared thermometer. Behind me, Audrey and her friend are talking again. It's hard to tell whether they don't realise I can hear them, whether they intend for me to hear them, or if they simply don't care either way. What happened to her hands, Audrey? Do you think she's got leprosy? That makes things fall off, doesn't it? Gout, maybe. Mmm... Their indignation at thinking I must have stolen an appointment has now turned into suspicion. They begin discussing whether or not I am contagious, whether the fact that I am missing fingers means that I am dangerous, whether I should be out of the house at all, let alone standing in a queue with other older people exposing myself to the world. It's a disgrace. Audrey's friend is rummaging in a handbag for some hand sanitizer. When we've been so careful, now we come here and there's all sorts we could catch. I don't tell them that I'm not contagious. I don't tell them that I've been shielding for over a year. I don't tell them anything at all. Okay, time to go in, love. The man raises his thermometer and points it at my forehead. Can you take your hat off for me so I can get a reading? 
I lift the brim of my hat so that the laser can scan my forehead. The man frowns. Sorry, it's not working. Can you take the whole thing off? My stomach tightens. I'd rather not. Can you try again? Bad hair day, he winks. Sorry, love, it's not working. Just whip it off for me for a second, yeah? I brace myself and take the hat off quickly, the cool air immediately rushing to my exposed scalp. The women behind me gasp loudly, but the man with the thermometer blinks and pretends not to notice my hair loss, scanning my forehead and nodding for me to put my hat back on. Oh, Audrey, she's got cancer. The woman behind me sounds sad, but equally triumphant. Oh, the wee one's got cancer. How terrible. She raises her voice even more. Young lass, we'll pray for you. I'm ushered inside, so I'm unable to correct them, which despite my previous silence, I have a strong desire to do. And that's probably for the best, because why should I have to explain myself to two women who have been berating my existence for the past 10 minutes? No, I don't have cancer. No, I don't have leprosy. No, I don't have gout. A kind doctor sticks a needle into my arm and I'm handed a timer and asked to sit on a chair for 15 minutes just to make sure I'm okay. The room feels like an aquarium, like I'm a deep sea diver, like we're all bodies floating past each other, tapping at the glass and waving from the other side. The swimming pool anaesthetic of dozens of operations bubbles under my skin. As I leave the healthcare centre, I imagine the two women telling this story to their friends, how they went to get their vaccines and there was this poor girl in front of them who had cancer and wasn't that horrible? Just awful. But don't you worry, because they told her they would pray for her, you know? And wasn't that a fine thing for them to have done? There you go. Okay, so that's why I bought a wig. <laughs> Thanks, Audrey. Thanks, Audrey's friend. Um, yeah, I am not thrilled that that's the reason that I bought the initial one, but I'm not gonna berate myself for doing that. Um, and I am pleased with the amount of fun that I have had with the wigs that I have and I'm glad that I found a style that works for me. Um, I'm not going to be buying, you know, loads of wigs in the future. It was just buying some to uh, work out what I wanted and now I have those and I'm going to be having fun with those and styling them accordingly and also not wearing them when I don't want to wear them and continuing in videos to sometimes wear them, not wear them, wear hats, not wear hats or whatever. I know that my specific situation is obviously relevant to a very small number of people but I hope the more general conversation surrounding hair loss or even just disfigurement and disability and how society interacts with both that and us is more helpful generally speaking i think it's good to talk about these things i think it's good to normalize them and to acknowledge how complicated the feelings surrounding it are it is not black and white i am not fitting into one box or another i don't feel joyful every day about wearing wigs and yes i sometimes still get upset about the fact that most of my hair has fallen out um whilst acknowledging that also I don't particularly care, like it's so strange. I don't care objectively when I think about it about my own hair, but I care about the way that that impacts my life and how people judge me and see me and more how emotionally exhausting that is to combat ableism. And I already have to do that with regard to my hands and other things to do with my disability. But at the same time, I have massive privilege because um, I can afford to buy these wigs and I can wear them and I uh, I can therefore pass if I want to for someone who doesn't have hair loss, whether or not that is my aim. Just loads of different things to think about. Um, and those were some of my thoughts today. Uh, and as I said, probably a bit all over the place, but that's what you signed up for if you came to this channel. And if you haven't already signed up for it and you would like to, please do join us on a regular basis because I will word vomit at you often, once a week, if, if not more, if that is something that you would like to experience. Um, I mostly talk about books on this channel, but I do also talk about disability. I have written lots of books and if you would like to find out about those, you can find them in the description box down below, including my uh, most recent book, which is The Sister Who Ate Her Brothers, which is a collection of gruesome some fairy tales from around the world, taken back to their traditional gory roots, but with a diverse set of characters, queer representation, positive representation of disability and disfigurement, including celebrating a bald princess. Um, I'm gonna love you and leave you. If you have any thoughts, please do share them in the comment section down below. 
Sending love to all of you and I will speak to you soon. Bye.